Hi everyone, Stepan here. It's Friday, so welcome to another Friday Million video. Uh, this week I want to go over a topic that has fascinated me absolutely over the last couple of months of my training, and that's the way strong players can imagine much more than uh, weak players, and the way strong players can, probably in their minds, uh, see potentially strong squares for their pieces without these, square, these squares actually being available. And I have found several uh, very interesting examples during the last few months. Uh, I won't be showing all of them to you, I'll just go over a few that I found very interesting and I hope this helps. So when you start learning the middle game, uh, you are often told, well, you have to improve your pieces, you have to maneuver your pieces into good squares, into outposts. For weak players, it's hard to imagine how an outpost can be created or how a weak square can be created. So today we are going to go over clearance sacrifices or uh, sacrifices which uh, give up material in order to create a weak square you could then exploit. That is especially effective when you are the one attacking and when you are the one who has, who is a piece short or two pieces short from delivering a deadly attack. So in most of these examples, uh, we are going to have positions where you can give up material to make one of your pieces decisively better. We're going to be looking at six games or positions from six games uh, from the last 130 years altogether. We're going to start with uh, Wilhelm Steinitz versus von Barteleben, which if you've seen Ben Feingold's lectures, you're going to know. Uh, he's one of my favorite uh, YouTubers and people on the internet, so I know that game very well. And it is this position on the board that occurred uh, in the game. In this position, Steinitz is white and it's white to play. So let's start with this example because it's the simplest one and it's, I think, fairly easy to understand what you have to be doing. So if you give black time, black is going to well, run away, consolidate, do something, uh, play something like king f7, rook e8 and find his feet. So if it's black to play, if I'm black, I'm playing king f7 uh, to stop your, your progress somehow. So how can you exploit that? Well, in the game, uh, Steinitz understood that his knight needs to get into play. Obviously, there is a pin along the e-file on the knight on e7. So if the king should move away, for example, with castles, or if the queen should move away, you, you, you win the knight and the game. So in this position, he found a great way to get his last piece into play and to, live, to deliver a deadly attack. He played the move d5. For the rest of the positions, for the last five positions, I'm going to ask you to pause the video before I show you the move. This one should be served as an introduction. So knight takes is, of course, illegal. Queen takes is legal, but stupid because queen e7 is checkmate. So you have no choice, basically. Uh, you have to take CD, and that's what was played in the game. Unless you understand what's going on, and then you have a choice, and then you get your king out of harm's way. The best move in this position was king f7, and after king f7, dc6, bc6, something like queen c4 check, of course, is much better for white, but after queen d5, black can play on for a few more moves. This is completely lost for black, but it's not over immediately. Instead of that, after d5, uh, von Barteleben took c takes d5. And now the point of the sacrifice is, of course, not to simply give a pawn and say, well, that's it, you are better, you're a pawn up. No, it was to free up the d4 square for the knight. So in the original position, the knight doesn't really have too many squares to go to. It's very hard for the knight to get into play. Also, this rook is, well, sort of stuck out of the game. After the move d5, the d4 square <clears throat> all of a sudden becomes a very, very strong square for white's knight to utilize. Obviously, the knight could be, <clears throat> excuse me, targeting c6, the knight could be jumping into b5, the knight could be jumping into, e, uh, into f5 or into e6, and the knight all of a sudden becomes a mon monster for the price of one pawn. So after c takes d5, of course, knight to d4 played. And now king f7 came in the game, but now it's too little too late, knight e6, and this knight is now about to create a decisive attack in conjunction with the queen and the rook. So again, we, if we compare this position where the knight is on f3 and not really 
threatening the black king in any way to the position of the knight d4, see uh, how the positioning of the knight was uh, was transformed and how the power of the knight has increased over the last two moves simply with a pawn sacrifice. So after knight d4, king f7, knight e6. Uh, if you don't know the game, I'm going to show you the last couple of moves. Uh, so rook h to c8 played, queen g4, g6 trying to defend because queen g7 was threatened. Now knight g5 check. This is an incredible move. Of course, the queen is hanging, so the king has to go to e8. Rook takes e7. <clears throat> incredible. Uh, yeah, if you don't know this, try to figure out what happens. Uh, what happens on queen takes? What happens on on king to d8? In the game, king f8 was played, and now rook to f7 check. King to g8. Rook to g7 check. Still can be taken. King to h8 and now rook to h7 and black resigned. Uh, there is a mate in ten moves in this position. If you want to, if you want to see it through, I would suggest that you analyze this game by yourself. I don't want to waste time on the beautiful patterns we have in the six games because this video would last uh, a year probably. Uh, the point is. In this position, if you have to continue your attack, if you have to increase the pressure, how are you going to do it? We have a, a clearance sacrifice with which you give up material to create squares for your pieces. d5, no good way to respond to that. cd5, knight d4, game over. The knight is jumping into e6 and the threats will become overwhelming. Okay, so this is a romantic example in which the player with black wasn't really that good. So let's look at the second example. This example is much harder and this I've done for my own tra training and then I've done it uh, in the lessons with, uh, with my students. Uh, in this position it's white to play. This is a game between two Serbian uh, grandmasters played in 2007. So let's try to follow through with the, with the same idea. So for the moment the bishop on g5 is attacked twice. Uh, retreating the bishop would, would give black precious time. Now what do I mean by precious time? Let's say let's say white doesn't want to trade, white plays bishop to e3. Now what would black's plan be? Black doesn't have space, black's rooks are obviously inactive, black has much worse pieces, but this is a sort of Sveshnikov, Nidorf <clears throat> type position in which you, well, of course, there's a pawn on d5 instead of it being a free square, but you still have to, same as in the Sveshnikov, liberate your position with f5. So in this position, black wouldn't play knight f6, black would play knight d6. And now all of a sudden, this knight has huge influence in the center, and the move f5 is coming. And there is no really, uh, there is no good way to defend against that. So if you give black time, he's going to untangle, consolidate, develop his pieces, and basically be equal. So in this position, uh, Ivanishevic found a great way to, to increase his advantage into, into a winning advantage, basically. After the next two moves, black is lost. If you want, you can pause the video uh, to find uh, what was played in the game. Okay, uh, so since your bishop is hanging and you don't have the ability to lose time, otherwise black will consolidate, you have to trade the bishops off. This part is easy, so bishop takes, queen takes, of course. Now, the hard part. Which of your pieces is not in the game, and where would it like to be? I remember the last example. Uh, in this position, Ivanishevic played the remarkable d6, uh, a pawn that can be taken two different ways. Either way, uh, it's, it's no good, and black basically has a losing position strategically after this move. The idea is, of course, by moving the pawn to d6, we are freeing up the d5 square for our knight. This is, again, a clearance sacrifice, which makes white's position so superior that black basically will never be able to develop freely. Now, pawn takes was played in the game. Let's look at what happens after knight takes. If knight takes d6, this is even worse than in the game. Knight d5, of course, now you can see the double attack on c7. For example, queen g5, which is one of the best moves. 
Rook takes e7 and not even material down. Black is completely busted. Just compare the quality of the two knights, compare the safety of the pawns in the position, and compare the king's safety. f7 is a weakness, b7 is a weakness, e5 is a weakness, the d6 knight is loose. Knight e7 is on the cards, knight f6 is on the cards, knight b6 as well. Rook c8 doubling up, uh, the position is overwhelming. In the game after d6, c takes was played, and after knight d5, we have a similar type of position, of course, here the queen is attacked, so queen to d8. We have a similar type of position where white is still a pawn down, black hasn't given the pawn back, allowing rook to c7 by keeping the knight on e8, he is guarding the c7 square. But in my opinion, that's, that's even worse, because these pieces are never going to develop now. This is just... This is just busted. In the game continued G3. You can find the whole game on chessbomb.com. Uh, basically, White had no problems winning from this position. So coming back to the starting position, you have more space, you have better pieces, but you have to increase your advantage. And this is something I think strong players see easily. For us, weaker players, it's very hard to imagine our pieces becoming good if there are our own pawns or pieces in the way. Don't be afraid to give up material to make your pieces decisively better. In this position, of course, trading strategically, if you know the basic rules, is bad for white. Because if you have more space, you don't want to trade. Because by trading off minor pieces, you are making the space advantage less significant. Whoever has more space wants more pieces on the board. Because more space means more maneuvering space for your pieces, more activity for your pieces, and of course less activity for the side that has no space. So trading of the bishop is counterintuitive. But it gives you precious time because the bishop was attacked. And after queen takes making our knight 10 times better by giving up one pawn. And after the knight jumps into d5, compare the starting position to the position after knight d5. Black is lost. Okay, uh, let's continue with a classical example. Uh, this one is less strategic and more uh, an attacking example in which the clearance sacrifice is so dominating that... that it basically leads to a winning attack. And it's, it wouldn't take 10 or 20 moves, as in the previous game, to convert on that advantage. Okay, so we are black here. Uh, we have to continue our attack. What do we do? Uh, in this position, if you want to pause the video, find the way to free up space for, for one of your pieces. Okay, uh, this one is simpler than the previous one. Uh, of course, the, the answer is c3. Now, this isn't even a pawn sacrifice. Of course, if, if the pawn is taken, then queen could take, but a knight c4 would again be um, better. c3 simply frees up the c4 square. Uh, in this game, uh, Mikhail Botvinnik was playing black, uh, Gavril Veresov was, was white, and he played rook to c1. Uh, b takes c3 is just crushing, knight c4, you don't even take with the queen, something like king c2, knight a3, king d2, knight c4, check, king e2, and, and this is going to be deadly soon enough. You can also, after king c2, continue with probably bishop to f uh, to f7 is a good move, forcing the knight away and simply reinforcing your position, uh, having influence on the e-file as well, and grabbing the e3 pawn. So let's say the right moves you simply take here, or you can win the exchange, or you can you can do whatever you want, it's over. After pawn to c3, the game is over. As I said in the game, bc3 wasn't played, rook c1 was played, but now knight c4. And after rook takes c3, uh, of course, you see the fork on the king and the queen, but your queen is attacked as well. The difference is that you are going to take his queen with your knight, he is going to take your queen with his rook, and of course, you win the exchange in the process, therefore, an easily convertible material advantage. In the game, rook c3 followed, knight d2 check, king c2, knight f3, bishop f3, and now bishop to f7, attacking the knight. Knight h4, rook takes c3, picking up a pawn. If you take the rook, then of course you, you don't win my queen, so you have to take the queen. King takes, and after king d2, rook d2 e8. Black is an exchange up, and clearly winning uh, no, no way for white to save the position. So again, coming back to the original position, all it took was 
a sacrifice of one pawn, in this case not even a sacrifice, but the clearance of your own material to make your pieces much, much better. Okay, now we are going to have a look at two complicated examples. The first three examples were, were quite simple. Uh, now we are moving on to a bit harder stuff. Uh, this is the game David Bronstein versus Arpad Vaida, played in the match between Hungary and, or I'm sorry, played in the match between Budapest and Moscow uh, in 1949. And in this position, uh, there is a tactical solution to White's problems, well, White's sweet problems. White has to improve his position uh, by giving up material and by clearing the field for his pieces. So if you want to pause the video, take a bit more time on this one. This one is a bit more complex. So try to find the whole idea, the whole continuation. Okay, so in this position, uh, David Bronstein played the move e5. Now, the immediate idea you might have thought of is knight e4. That is correct. But uh, first of all, after d takes e5, which is forced, because if you move the knight, well, if you move the knight to e8, which is the only square, uh, you are going to be in trouble. Uh, so d takes e5. Uh, this is the same as in the Ivanishevich Miladinovic example, where you need to trade off before you continue your, your idea. Of course, in this position, if you play knight e4, you just, you just lose a rook. So he traded first. A rook takes d7. Bishop takes d7 played, and now knight to e4. Now this is a triple attack on the knight, so something has to be done. Uh, king to g7 would uh, be a bad move, just a bad move. Okay, so in this position, uh, Arpad Vaida took on e4. Okay, now the bishop is attacked three times on g5, so white has to take. And of course, this isn't immediately losing because black doesn't have to play queen to c7. Black has a tricky idea which of course can be responded to easily if you are as strong as David Bronstein. So black played g5. Of course this pawn is now defended twice. So if you take the pawn then I just win. So bishop takes g5 would win on the spot. Okay but Bronstein played bishop takes d8 and after pawn takes h4 Bishop takes h4. The whole idea of the combination was that this knight doesn't have anywhere to go and the knight is completely trapped. So this was a very hard tactical example, I know, but the idea is the same as in the previous examples. So in this position, the knight only has, well, two squares. If you go to d6, then of course, bishop to e7 would pick up an exchange and that would be horrendous. Uh, these squares are taken, 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 sorry taken, taken. Now, uh, the only sensible square is knight to d2, but after knight to d2, rook to d1, picks up the bishop, knight c4, rook takes bishop, game over, uh, black resigns three moves later. Bishop pair against the knight is just too much. So let's, uh, so let's go back to the original position. So what white did in this position was he wanted to increase the pressure on f6, which was obviously the weakest point in black's camp. To do that, he needed to include another attacker. Obviously, the only attacker that could contribute to the pressure on the f6 square is the c3 knight. If this was black's pawn, then no problem, you take it. But if it's your pawn, a clearance sacrifice has to be played. So e5, okay. Pawn takes, forced, rook takes, best move, bishop takes. I, I guess queen takes would just lose to bishop takes knight. I mean, that, that's simple enough. So after bishop takes knight e4, and after knight e4, this incredible trade happens, after which the knight has no sensible squares and you, you win. Also, after knight e6, you don't play bishop e7, you simply play, knight, uh, you simply play rook to d1. Excuse my uh, stupidity in this example. You just pick up a piece like that. No need to win the exchange when you can win a piece. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this position is from the game Teksuren Engbat versus Yuri Schulman, played in the US in the Foxwoods Open in 2002. Uh, uh, Engbat is white, it's white to play in this position. And this is, I think, the most complicated of all examples. And again, it's a strategic plus tactical plan. Uh, white combined two factors in this position. Uh, 
uh, if you want to pause the video to try and calculate it. Okay, so in this position, you have to ask yourself, what's the biggest weakness in the black camp? What's the biggest weakness in black's position? After you find it, finding the right move becomes almost automatic. Uh, the biggest weakness in black's position is the g6 square, which uh, in conjunction with the strong white pieces could be deadly, could be terminal, could lead to mate in a couple of moves. So, the first question is, how do I increase the pressure on that square? The second question is, what do I want to do with my minor pieces, which are not playing at all? Once you see that your minor pieces can get into the game via the e4 square, then, of course, the move e5 becomes very, very clear. Okay, in the game king g7 was played, which I think is the best try. Let's just uh, try to see what happens on f takes and d takes. If f takes, then of course queen takes g6, and after king to h8, rook h6, knight h6, queen h6, king g8, queen g6, king h8, rook h1, game over. If after e5, d5, then same thing, queen g6 and and over, same variation, doesn't really matter. If after e5, knight e5 is played, then the bishop is hanging, so okay, rook takes bishop. If f takes g3, then black loses by force again, because we can play rook takes g6, and if you take with the knight, same idea, knight takes, queen takes, king h8, rook h1, checkmate. And after rook takes g6, uh, king to f7, we just go rook to h6, uh, and yeah, we continue putting pressure on his position. We now have this lovely square for our pieces. We can get our other rook into play. We can play queen to h7, which is most decisive, and basically game over. So after e5 in the game, king g7 was played. Of course, he had to defend the g6 square. But now, e f6, queen f6, and knight e4. We just got our knight in into the position, and now this knight is going to be um, the factor that tips the scales in white's favor in the attack and now the, the attack becomes simply overwhelming uh, queen e7 was played the queen was attacked bishop h4 attacking the queen again g5 was tried but now if you want to pause the video again a nice little tactical solution okay bishop takes g5 and after bishop takes g5 rook h7 played again exploiting the queen's diagonal king h7 knight g5 check King h6, queen h7 check, a beautiful combination. Uh, king takes g5, queen g7 check, king h4, queen h7 check, king g5. A bit of repetition, rook h1 check. And you can see, well, we don't have to go any further. I mean, this is bishop, knight, rook, queen, and pawn versus king. Uh, obviously, these pieces are not playing at all. I found this absolutely remarkable, this, this attacking idea. Of course... It's complicated if you don't know what to look for. There are two things you have to look for in this position. A, uh, how do I exploit the weakest point in black's position? B, how do I get my inert pieces into play? I need to create a square for them. Therefore, e5 is ticks bo both boxes and wins the position for white. Okay, the final example is tricky. Not because it's hard to find the idea, but because the idea doesn't work. And this is why I chose it. Uh, this example I found in my favorite tactics book uh, by uh, Lisitsin, uh, Georgi Mikhailovich Lisitsin. The book was published in Yugoslavia in 1985 or 7, something like that. And when I started playing chess four years ago, um, yeah, uh, most people I met used this book for tactics training. I'm not sure internet tactics were a big thing at the time in Croatia. They probably were, but I just didn't know about them. So basically, this was the tactics book. Uh, there are three books in the series. Uh, it's called Strategy and Tactics, Strategia e Tactica. Uh, book one is for about 1,800 players. Book two is for about 2,000 rated players. And book three is, is for about 21, 2,200. This is from book two. And this example I solved successfully, or so I thought. Uh, and... Recently, just two weeks ago, I gave it uh, as, as a problem to someone and we did it during the lesson. And when we, when we finished the task, I was happy because, yeah, we found the correct solution, blah, blah, blah. 
then I decided to use the game for this lesson, for this video, I'm sorry. And this is the first time I checked uh, the variations which I had calculated two years ago with an engine, and they were completely wrong. So that goes to show that books that were written 30, 40 years ago might not be absolutely correct. Still, it's hard to see why it doesn't work. Okay, so in this position, if you had to find the same idea as before, uh, of course, there is only one move that comes to mind. Uh, pause the video, find it if you, if you can't. So, uh, the problem here is we would like to play queen takes h3, but of course, rook takes h3. So, we need to do something about that. Knight to d3 doesn't really work because bishop takes and we don't really have time to deliver checkmate. So, what we do is we do a clearance sacrifice, we make room for our very strong knight to come into the game and we interfere with the rook on a3 at the same time we play the move e3. Okay, uh, now there are two possibilities, rook takes or knight takes, if you do nothing then either pawn takes rook or queen h3. Both should be losing and again followed up what, by, knight, by knight e4 which is incredibly strong. Now, there are two things in this position which you would like to exploit. One is this square, one is, or three things, I'm sorry. One is h3, one is g2, which of course is double attacked by your, by your rook, and also f2. If you can get your knight to e4, then f2 becomes an extremely weak square. So after e3, first I'll show you what was played in the game and what I thought was the correct variation. So rook takes. Now, in itself, that's a huge mistake. Uh, knight takes is much better, but still, after knight to e4, uh, white is still better if he plays correctly. And I wonder if you can find the refutation, which I, I couldn't think of when I was solving this. In the book, um, this, this solution is given, uh, or I'm sorry, this was played in the game, rook f to e2, and now, of course, it's just game over. I hope you can find this tactical sequence, rook takes g2. And after rook takes g2, queen to f2 check is game over. The rook is pinned, so after king h2, queen takes is checkmate. But after knight e4, turns out that white is better after rook takes e4. And I haven't found this myself. I never thought about this long-term uh, positional exchange sacrifice. So it's as if white is doing uh, what black did to him with the move e3 so after f takes e4 of course you have to take now knight e6 the knight jumps into an incredibly strong square you have to take it once you take it this pawn is incredibly strong so after something like knight f6 queen d4 d5 bishop b5 white is not winning but he is better and the fact that he is an exchange down doesn't really amount to much because this pawn is very strong uh, f5 is coming and you basically have two connected past pawns and no attack for the moment so yeah that was the way to refute uh knight e4 um yeah just taking with the rook of course the variation given and played in the game is just a mate in three moves no defense to that coming back to the original position uh, the move which i discarded immediately when i was doing this for the first time was knight takes and after knight takes, you have, as black, basically overestimated your strategic idea of playing this clearance sacrifice. Now, of course, you don't continue with knight e4 here. You want to take on h3 and threaten mate. The problem is that after queen takes h3, knight e6 is a very strong move. I mean, what do you do here? You're not threatening the knight. You're not threatening g2. Everything is defended. And again, white is just playing his own game, attacking your rook, forcing you to help him create a passed pawn. So after bishop takes e6, uh, d takes e6, uh, let's say knight to e4 played, let's say rook to c2. What do you have here? I mean, this knight looks very good, but this pawn is very strong. Uh, white's position seems... A bit disjointed but it's actually pretty fine and and black doesn't have anything so this is an example of of such clearance sacrifice which you could be tempted to play but it simply doesn't work now of course in the game platter uh, played it and it turned out for the best because gadolinski couldn't find the best continuation so even if there is a defense or a refutation your opponent might not be able to find it but i just wanted to show you this example so that you're not tempted to play it without precise calculation. Of course, if Georgi Mihailovich Lisitsin could make a mistake and not find the refutation, then everybody can. But still, try to 
try to play this carefully. Okay, uh, I hope you got something from the six examples. I hope you liked the video. And, and again, as I said, you can find all of these games either on chess.com or on chessbomb. Some of them you can find analyzed online. Uh, I would say they are mostly very famous games. So go through the entire game, see what uh, what was the prelude to these positions. Of course, that will, that will help you un understand these clearance sacrifices even better. Uh, and yeah, see you next week. Uh, and please let me know what you think about this video. Thank you very much and stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.